On the Ground, presented by The Cube. Here's your host, John Furrier. Hello everyone, I'm John Furrier with Silicon Angles The Cube. We're on the ground here in Palo Alto, California. Catalyst uh, Ventures Partners, we're here. With Managing Director Steve Harrod, Cube alumni. Um, you know, third year, third, second year, third year? Three years. Three, sure three years as a venture capitalist, a former CTO of VMware, obviously a great industry player, great uh, person in the community uh, in, in plugged in. Welcome to On the Ground, great to see you. This is great, thanks John. So this year uh, we're hearing a lot of talk about um, the bubble bursting, certainly Apple forecast on their, on their awesome earnings call yesterday about um, you know, record uh, shipments, 18 billion in profit, 76 billion in cash. The iPhone's only eight years old, going on you know, nine years old this year. This is just the beginning, and yet this bubble's not bursting, or it's kind of reshaping, but not in a major way, but still a lot of great opportunities in tech. If the iPhone's going on its ninth year, it's coming into middle school. So what's <laughs> your take on this uh, trends that are happening now? Certainly the enterprise is hot. What, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, it, right now it's, it's wild on all fronts. You know, last year was wild because there was irrational exuberance everywhere and money being thrown left and right at, at sort of all sorts of ideas. I kind of feel like this is the year kind of, of, of getting real on so many fronts. And this is where it kind of like these shocking things like uh, profitability and, and how you're going to have a, a proper margin and, and grow the business. Those are back um, absolutely as the dominating factors right now. So I, I see a lot of companies these days that are uh, they've raised a Series A or a seed round, meaning they have a cool idea, but the questions now are how are you going to scale it? How are you going to make money from it? Um, how do you go to market with this? And that's where you go from being a technology to a business. I enjoy, always enjoy our conversations. We talk about more the long game in, in tech, being a CTO of VMware, you've seen that. We've had talks with Jerry Chen, who's also at Greylock, one of your cohorts here in the venture community. And there's a long view on the tr this transformation, this platforming of, with the cloud and, and, and data, and yep. obviously mobility, I mentioned the iPhone. Um, but yet now the capital markets are shifting. You're seeing a lot more IPOs and some lackluster performance, but yet this you know, secondary finance is going on. Still, there's a lot of guys like you making the long bets, as they say, go big or go home. There are some game-changing opportunities. What are you seeing out there that are still the great opportunities for entrepreneurs to dig into? Obviously, Security's one that's top of mind for you. What are you seeing? Yeah, I, I just, as a whole, I, I couldn't be more bullish on where the world is. And, and obviously, there'll be ups and downs in terms of capital markets, but this uh, like real innovation doesn't have a cycle. And you find the right people at the right time. Um, these macro trends are unstoppable. So. Uh, we, we get involved in all sorts of things as general catalyst. Uh, we're here in Palo Alto where we obviously are in the Silicon Valley side, but we're in New York and Boston as well. And so I think it's really important to be looking not even just across the U.S., but globally at all the things that are changing and making sure we're part of that. I will just say like the, the most uh, thing that I see all the time, it's very easy to get obsessed with what people talk about in Silicon Valley. And there's obviously amazing cutting edge stuff and people are building startups faster and doing more things yourself, I, like all kinds of things you can do now you couldn't do before. And uh, the point also though is that the rest of the world isn't on the same speed and not on the same sort of adoption yeah. cycle. So on the one hand, we want to know absolutely where the world's going and we like to think about trends like what are engineers at Google or Facebook doing and how can we make that applicable to the rest of the world? That's a very interesting approach to it. But you got to stay in touch with customers like yeah. the Fortune 1000 all over the world and the problems they have with PC management. It's a real thing. Like you think if you're here, it's all Macs and phones only. Um, so I think I would just say there's a lot of forward looking yeah. stuff. You want to be there at the right time, but there's a ton of existing yeah. problems that are ready for newer solutions. Yeah, you know, the exciting thing about Silicon Valley is there's a lot of shiny new toys that are developing and certainly a lot of experimentation, failure and successes. Yeah. But at the same time, at the end of the day, it's about the business outcomes for the folks who are trying to solve their problems. Mm -hmm. And that was clearly articulated by the CEO, Mark Hurd at Oracle when I talked to him, because really it's yeah. a timing game on execution. So I want to bring that question to you, which is, okay, you got the shiny new toys, you guys are looking at a lot of new cutting edge stuff. Some of it's like crazy good, go big or go home. Some of it's more practical blocking and tackling, get profit, get scale. Right. Um, but yet customers still want to solve their problems. How hard is it, or is it getting easier for startups to compete in the enterprise businesses? Mm -hmm. Because in the old days, it used to be only the big guys can, can serve those customers. Right. Then with the cloud, startups came in, but now it's getting more complicated. You got security, you got integration, you got horizontal and vertical specialization. Yep. These are interesting dynamics. What's your thoughts there, and, and what's your advice to your portfolio companies and startups? Yeah, and this is a great topic and one we deal with every single day. I'd say there are kind of three competing factors that are always at play here. Um, first of all, you know, enterprises are the companies that have a lot of money to use versus individuals. They have uh, problems that have hit at scale because they're so much bigger and hitting them. And 
certain types of problems, such as how they reach their own customers or how they secure their, their um, crown jewels, have become so important that they're even board level issues. So at the one hand, there's this great demand for solutions and more accountability and holding. Um, on the flip side, one of the challenges of the last couple of years is that there's so many startups funded, especially in certain areas, that there's so much noise. And how is a CIO supposed to understand which of these many cybersecurity companies is the one that's really going to help them? Or how do they choose among so many more things? So I think that has put a more emphasis on, uh, on both marketing as well as like how are you proving that you can truly solve their problems in a shorter amount of time. I think that's a really good driver. So we often ask from the time a company first uh, sees your product, how quickly does it take mm -hmm. them to actually get it off the shelf and in use? And that's a metric that... Uh, is, is super critical these days. I think people haven't always watched as much. Um, the other thing is back towards the third part of it, which is funding. Um, I do think right now you kind of look through startups as these phases, usually for what I look at as kind of high tech companies trying to use new technologies in a hard way. So there's a technology risk that you have to get through. Can I, can I even build this thing? Then you have to prove that there's at least two or three interesting customers that, that would actually pay for it and use it. And that's sort of phase two of the company. And then phase three is how can I do this mm -hmm. sales and a repeatable model that has margin to it and could be a sustainable business. So each of these requires yeah. different people, different questions that we ask, uh, different skill sets that are in there. And track and those attraction hard. proof points too, as well as that you want to look for that traction for the startup to see that validation with the idea kind of commercializing. Yeah. Talk on that on that thread, what's the B rounds like right now? I mean, obviously B rounds are a big discussion in the industry. That second financing, the A rounds have been bigger in the in, the, in this past uh, cycle, you know, 10, 15 million dollar A rounds. B rounds tend to be a little bit higher, maybe even 30 plus. Right. Right. Um, but that's really an indicator for the market. Yep. Um, we're hearing Bs are tight, B rounds are, are hard, the traction points are Can you comment on that and what's your thoughts on that? Is it more revenue? Is it more traction? Yeah. What's your thoughts on the B Well, it, it comes from this pipeline of companies starting, which is so awesome around here. It's um, it's fairly easy to get a seed round. It's, it's harder, but not as hard to get an A, and then it's harder, but to get a B. So it's always this filtering or this like Hunger Games type of thing that's going on. Um, I would just say that the questions now for a B round and the proof points required are just more poignant. And it's a, it's a supply and demand discussion where there are, you know, perhaps it's higher level of criteria being applied for these bigger rounds. And back to the specific point, in the enterprise, uh, the question that any good VC firm is really going to be looking for at a B is, you know, they've proven that the technology works. They've proven that they have good people skills and can recruit. They've proven that um, at least a handful of, com of companies will pay something for it. The B round is, in theory, it is really created for, I've figured out this pattern for how I'm going to sell, and this will be the accelerant that lets me hire more people and repeat that process in a different way. So it, it is, at the end of the day, you've proven that you have a repeatable way of it selling something. It could be something. big, it could be big. Yeah. That's, the, that's the thesis. But it's, it's, it's actually in more, it's I've figured out who I need to reach with what <laughs> message and with what means. Is it a phone call, is it an email campaign? You've at least figured out a pattern that you can repeat. You don't typically want to experiment with hiring giant sales forces that you haven't yeah. figured that out in a B round. So that's, that's why it's just gotten more stringent on that front. Awesome, that's a scale piece. That's that Dave Bonte would say is rationalization. Things get, get more focused. That's more growing of the market. Yep. Um, I want to talk about developers. Um, yep. You know, when you're the CTO of VMware and you still are active in the community, um, the community was really a key part of that growth and mm -hmm. certainly funded that whole you know, virtualization trend and then cloud. What's your take on developers today? Because now you're seeing uh, companies looking at commercial available software right. and solutions in the cloud, uh, which brings back like it doesn't have to be do it yourself. It has to. Be, there is some commercialization opportunities for companies to make money right. on. You know, in the old days, startups would make it because they didn't have a lot of cash, and they would build their own web scale stuff. So now we're moving to this next generation of developers. What's your thoughts on the makeup, the persona, any any sentiment that you're seeing trends? around today's developer community? Yeah, I think it, this has been going on for a while, but I do think there are more choices than ever for now. I think what most people have recognized is that at the very top level of businesses, more and more things are obviously digital, more ways of reaching the customer than ever through omnichannel or whatever else are requiring developers to get there. So more of the company's value is limited by what they can get out, either by speed of development or people that they can hire. So at the top level, Developers are a scarcer resource, resource than ever, and wanting to make them both uh, productive and happy so that they stay around uh, matter. And the end result of that has been that developers do absolutely, at big companies and small companies, have more influence over how things are done than in the past. 
and we, we've actually talked about this before too, it's, um, it, you know, you can't tell developers to do certain things uh, when they can just get up and go somewhere else. And if you're on a crappy schedule for products, they want to go somewhere where they can get their work out. So that's why DevOps yeah. movements and tools are there. Uh, if they want to be productive and write beautiful applications, they're going to choose one framework over some older one that was the standard. So I think the big recognition, first of all, is developers have more influence over where the spend and where the tools are going, and that companies can and should uh, look at their productivity and happiness as a very, very critical part of the puzzle. Translation, don't jam stuff down the developer's throat. <laughs> yeah, and translation to startups is, yeah. like, make developers love you. You've got to recognize developers don't ultimately usually pay. It's usually someone else yeah. there. But make developers love you, have operations teams pay for you. Like, that's kind of the yeah. mantra if you're in the development world. We mentioned DevOps, you mentioned DevOps. Agile's obviously is, is out, out in the open now, it's everyone's up adopting the DevOps, but it's really implementing to the application level. So you mentioned developers are closer yep. to the action. We've had many talks on theCUBE on that. But now you're seeing as, let's say retail, is a retail event this January. You know, retail would be conversations like, oh, omni-channel, this, but now that's being disrupted by DevOps. It's a horizontal integration. So the DevOps is actually impacting all aspects of this digital transformation okay. that's happening. So I want to get your thoughts on, on that whole digital transformation, if you assume that the app has a development component and or cloud and data, it will be horizontally disrupting and might have some vertical packaging you know, per, per the verticals. So I ask you, what the old way versus the new way? If you had to kind of like create sides of the street, old side of the street and new side of the street, what are some of the forces <laughs> that you see happening out there? The old way of doing things and the new way. Can you give some examples, some technology, some approaches that you've seen, startups yeah. and examples? Yeah, that's yeah, great set of questions to go into. I, maybe at the top level, um, so definitely, actually there's this funny survey, John. Uh, I, I read this thing that said 92% of CEOs want to deliver software faster. I was like, who in the world, <laughs> who's the 8% who doesn't want to? <laughs> um, so that, so at, a, at a top level, again, because it is the thing that's, that's exposing access to the products, everything around businesses are coming through that. Mm -hmm. It can be the bottleneck for putting out new SKUs and new products and reaching your customer and good support. So. At the top level, everyone wants to move faster. I think, um, to talk out of two sides of my mouth, I think you want to have the tools that allow people to experiment and get the feedback more quickly when appropriate. I do think the downside of this is for certain types of software, whether it's uh, maybe lower in the stack, uh, things that have to be absolutely rock solid and you actually want them to have more bake time before they're put out into the wild. Um, that's where th those advocates would call it fragile programming <laughs> instead of agile programming. because. You yeah. really do need to have some things that bake. There's a five nines aspect to it. There's more ops, less dev kind of thing, right? That's right, and that's a big chunk of it. The other chunk for enterprise in particular, um, there is a when you're really truly an enterprise company, especially lower in the stack, there are a lot of dependencies on you in terms of what tools you're plugging into and people that have been trained around how to use you. Now, I think that's something if you're in the consumer world, you probably don't appreciate quite as much. And so, the ability to absorb and have all of the ecosystem work around a super fast moving piece of code causes a lot of challenges as well. So I do think you you have to apply this technique to the right areas and with the right thinking. And absolutely experimentation is better than ever. You can get real time feedback. You know, that matters in every part of it. But knowing that some parts have to just be rock solid and shouldn't move that quickly. Is Thoughts on digital does. data as in this data transformation. We say digital data, our thesis that we're, we're speculating on now is that customers would prefer to buy from a brand, whether it's consumer enterprise, prefer to buy from a brand that has digital assets that are engaging. Well, that's basically data. Assets are now data. And data's got to be protected, and it's got to be integrated, all kinds of opportunities around data. What's your thoughts around today's world around big data, fast data, just data in general as an asset, a digital <laughs> yeah, asset? Well, it's, obviously, it's There's all kinds of data. <laughs> You're all generating of data. plenty of it as we speak, too. It's, it, you know, it's everywhere through, through um, all the different assets. And I do think this rise in the, the hotness, as we were talking about earlier, of whether it's uh, data analytics or uh, people are using AI and machine learning in different, maybe not always the right way, but the idea is that there is so much data, the real challenge I think for everyone now is what do you make of it and how do you actually get an insight that you do something with. So absolutely more sources than ever and this is whether it's you know Splunk dealing with logs all the way up to marketing analytics looking at how their drip campaign is working. Um, I think everyone's fully recognized now that great, we have a lot of data, what do I do with it? And that's where all these, uh, I think a lot of great innovations are happening. Yeah, I mean, I think still it's really early there. I, I'm super excited about, as you know, data, we love data. Uh, the cube is looking at Wiki Bond. Um, just What's up with you these days? I mean, obviously your focus has recently been security. We talked about that. What are you excited about this year? Um, what are some of your investments and what trends are you uh, you're watching closely? Yeah, I mean, security is a, is a big, big focus of mine and clearly it's got a long way to go to be perfect, but it is a spending priority and I think there are a lot of great technologies coming to bear um, across a rapidly changing world of public clouds and mobile phones and 
um, and a lot of weird attackers coming in new ways. So that continues to be a big focus and a priority for uh, enterprises. But also to the point on DevOps and generally people productivity is something that I've been really heavily focused on, whether it's tools that let developers be more productive or you'll speak with Zugata in a little bit. Uh, how do you actually make sure that the employees you have are uh, improving and developing themselves as possible, as fast as possible? But all this has to be done in like the modern expectations of a, of a mobile world and of a world where I don't want something once a year, I want it real time. And, and I think it applies to whether it's me figuring out how I'm doing as an employee and getting better or uh, putting out a product and getting real time feedback. It, it ultimately comes down to more sources of data being used in a quicker cycle to make things better. So basically digital disruption or transformation as you're referring to there is really a process change fundamentally within yeah. companies. I mean, everything is essentially being disrupted. It's not the old way of doing it might be vertically stacked or there's the application that does it. Now there's a lot more integration and you know, cross-functional process improvements or process changes. I think it affects absolutely everything. Every, every part of our, of our lives and how we're doing that, certainly around uh, the people side and the technology side, but the marketing side, the, the product development side. And like if you zoom all the way back, I think what's ultimately happening is things move faster than ever. They change faster and uh, they grow faster. So everything has to change. <laughs> like if you're doing something once a year, uh, that's sort of like the world has changed yeah. a huge amount. You just mentioned iPhones. Like these things are only in their middle, sort of middle teen years <laughs> or early teen years. Yeah. Eighth like, grade, is it? What, ninth, nine year olds? Nine year, oh, but anyway, it's, it's, yeah. it's early. It's so, super early, a lot of opportunities. Yeah. What are you most excited about right now? What is, uh, let me rephrase. What's the coolest thing going on in Palo Alto and Silicon Valley that you're seeing come through the boardroom here? at Catalyst, is there a trend, is there a coolness? Obviously, people no. talk about AI, virtual reality, obviously you see about Facebook and others doing some cool stuff. Um, yep. Obviously, developer communities are, are exploding. What are some of the cool things you've seen come through this room? At a macro level, the coolest thing going on right now is um, I think when people leave school now, um, it used to be you would think that I want to go be a lawyer or a doctor, but like creating a new company is so uh, top of mind for people that wouldn't have previously thought about that. So what's at the top level, what's so cool is the diversity of ideas coming in, and diversity isn't even just in this tech space. It's how do I apply this to some new disease, or how do I apply it to something else? Um, so this this notion of like starting something new, applying across the board, I think it couples with uh, um, there's definitely an attitude among sort of newer graduates coming out that you know that they want to do something meaningful, and it's it's sort of cliche, and it's like it's it digital cliche. transformation for entrepreneurship. Across the board, like just name anything that we deal with in life, whether it's food or doctors or anything, there are people trying to, to try something new around that. And I think this, just the notion of failure modes and everything is, is fine. People are very happy with the trade-off. Uh, we're psyched to have, have you here on the ground. We'll see you at theCUBE. Uh, any events you got on the radar we make sure we connect with you on? Or well, you guys, you're in a VMworld? lot of the good ones. RSA is <laughs> right around the corner. Yeah. That's where a lot of, uh, a lot of security companies are going to be uh, really going wide and we'll have it's always fun to, to go to VMworld and to uh, reinvent all kinds of interesting things going on in that world. All right, Steve, thanks for taking the time here on there. This is theCUBE on the ground. I'm John Furrier with Steve Herod, Managing Director of Catalyst Partners, uh, the Cost Ventures. We'll be right back with more after the short break. <laughs>